by way of clarification, however, I am not a sheikh. I'm not a traditionally trained Islamic scholar, uh, so I cannot answer a fiqh question for you, <laughs> and, and so on and so forth. Uh, mashallah, you have many such resources in the Bay Area who can do that. Uh, I am someone who uh, thinks about and, and loves studying about and, and trying to understand Islam as a faith, as a culture, as a civilization, historically and going into the future. That was my introduction. So, what I wanted to talk about tonight is the future of Islam, which I think is something we don't talk about nearly often enough. We often, and for good reason, talk about the past. Sometimes we talk about the present. But we rarely ever meaningfully and thoroughly talk about what the future will look like. There are some different reasons for that. One of these, if I'm honest, is because I think our communities are not confident. We don't believe that we have a bright or vigorous future ahead of us. We are often afraid of what lies ahead as opposed to thinking about the opportunities that may lie ahead. But secondly, and more importantly, religious cultures stand at odds with the modern world in one very fundamental way. The big difference between societies in the past, all societies, Muslim or otherwise, and the world that the West has created is not technology or science or democracy. These are obviously big differences. The main difference is newness. This is the big thing. In the pre-modern world outside of the West, most people did not assume the future was going to be different from the past, let alone that it should. Most people believed that their grandchildren would live lives very similar to their great-grandparents. If your grandparents married from within the same village and practiced the same culture and the same profession, five generations down the road, you would too. The West produced a break. And that unleashed immense power when you began to think about what does it mean to plan for the future? What does it mean to shape the future? What does it mean to dream of a different or better future? As well as incredible instability, right? Because suddenly, just because something is new often means it is good. So you've seen this if you have kids, or you are a kid, right? You see that whatever is new is good and whatever is old, and old means like four years ago, is automatically embarrassing and bad, right? We live in this constant present, this amnesia about the past and eagerness for the future. So that for Muslims is often a little bit off-putting. We don't know how to deal with that, especially since we anchor our identity in the past. So I wanted to talk about that. And I'll talk about it through the book. So long story short, five years ago, I wrote a memoir about growing up Muslim. And I titled it How to Be a Muslim, it was actually a story about how I often tried to be Muslim and failed. It was about struggling with Islam, trying to make sense of my Muslim background and what it meant to be Muslim in the world. And, you know, a number of people bought the book thinking it was like a how-to manual on how to be Muslim, which it was not. And I'm not qualified to write that book. And nevertheless, after a year, the book did reasonably well, and the publisher said to me, would you like to actually write an introduction to Islam? And so I said, yeah, sure, why not? That's actually a good idea. I've spent about... 16 years of my life, most of my adult life, teaching about Islam, mostly to audiences that were not Muslim. And so I had a decade and a half of experience, so let me do that. Let me talk about what Islam is. So the first thing you do when you want to write a book is you sit down and cry. And then the second thing you do is you start buying up or going to the library or downloading or, or whatever it is, the books that people have already written on the subject. Because the worst thing in the world is if you write a book somebody's already written. Nobody wants to do that, right? So what you do is, you, I you know, got a big pile of books, Introductions to Islam, and I read them and read them and read them. And there were many good ones, right? I won't tell you which the good ones were and the bad ones were because you should buy my book first, but the important thing is there were a lot of good ones. But most of them did this one thing. They introduced Islam through facts and figures, through chronologies, timelines, maps, sectarian movements. These are Sunnah, these are Shi'i, right? And these are all important things. I'm not... Uh, discounting that, but it felt to me like something really fundamental was missing, and the thing that was missing was the explanation of why. Right? So I'll give you an example. Right? You all live in a blue state. I live in a red state. Right? Although if Summer, my wife, is listening, she will insist it is a purple state that has momentarily lost its mind, 
But nevertheless, the last two elections, at least, Ohio has voted for uh, the Republican candidate for president, right? So as we know, and I'm, this is not a surprise to anyone, right? Republicans and Democrats often look at each other like they're crazy. And often in our conversation, we can't seem to imagine why people do the things they do. And I remember once reading uh, a book about Islam in Lebanon by a man named Augustus Norton, which, by the way, is one of the greatest names ever. But Augustus Norton said something in the course of this book that's really important to understand. Most people aren't crazy. Actually, most people think in the exact same way. The difference is the assumptions they start with are different. So if you start from two different places, even if you're moving in the same way, you're very likely to end up in a different place. And then the experiences you have, the information you collect in the course of your life, pushes and pulls you in different directions. So like, I'll give you a simple example. If you believe that everything you have in life was due to your effort alone, right, which is an assumption, it's, it's effectively impossible to, I mean, even know how to examine that, right? Then if someone comes along and says, hey, we should pay higher taxes and support XYZ program to help the environment or help people who are less well off, you'll say that's crazy. Someone outside might say that's selfish, but for that person it may very well be that that is a fully logical and consistent position. If you believe, on the other hand, that everything you have comes from someone or something else, and someone says you should share that, it may feel totally natural and normal to do that. And someone else would think that person's crazy. What are they going to do in the future if they just keep giving their money away? How are they going to plan strategically for their kids or grandkids if they're just giving money away left and right without thinking about things? So neither person is actually irrational. They just have different assumptions about the way the world works, and then they act on it. So I thought to myself, one of the problems mainstream American audiences have is we don't make sense to them. Like, why would you do the things you do? It's very strange. And yet, if you understand the larger concepts that animate the Muslim worldview, then everything makes sense. It's like, you know, I have a lot of friends growing up who grew up in very Muslim households, but no one ever told them why they were supposed to do the things they were, they were doing. Does that make sense, right? So like, you had to fast in Ramadan. You weren't supposed to talk to girls. You had to, wow, I got chai, that's kind of amazing. See, everyone should write a book, you get chai. Um, uh, so, you know, in effect, if you don't know why you're doing something, then the obvious thing that's gonna happen is, Someday, something is going to come along and knock you sideways and make you question everything. And if you don't have a good reason for doing the thing you're doing, you're probably not going to keep doing it. And so I thought I would write a book about, like, what are the big ideas of Islam? The ideas that, that really shape who we are and why we do what we do. Do you have a question? No. Maybe. Captain America. Yeah. Yes. How are you? Can you take my book? Um, yes, because I believe everything was not due to my own effort. So you can come and take it. But I need it right now because I need it for the talk. So I can give it to you after. I'll sign it too. Do you want to sign it to Captain America or someone else? Because you have the shirt. My name? You want me to sign it to Harun? Your name. What's your name? Ahmed. Okay, it will be to Ahmed slash Captain America. That would be a plot twist if Captain America was a kid named Ahmed at MCC East Bay. Um, nobody saw that one coming. But yes, you, you got yourself a book. See, initiative wins the day. Okay, so here's the thing. So then I thought to myself, I want to write a book about why Muslims believe what they believe. And so I talked about this in the khutbah earlier today, that there's this philosophical distinction, and I'm sorry if it's really boring, but I'll make it make sense, between description and prescription. Description is, tell me what something is, and prescription is, tell me why. So I'll give you a simple example, right? If, uh, if you say, for example, uh, how do I drive from here to there, or how do I turn on the washing machine, or how do I do X, Y, and Z, that's a description, right? I'm just telling you how to do something, right? How do I turn on the microphone? Prescription is, should I? Right? Is it a good idea for me to do this or not? As a simple example, like from an Islamic legal perspective, right? You can ask an imam, how do I get married? 
right? And the Imam will, get, will give you a list of, you know, these are the conditions and this is the nikah and, you know, X, Y, and Z. That doesn't really answer should you get married, right? That's a completely different and much more difficult question to answer, right? That requires a lot of thought. So as I started, I started with just description, right? This is what Muslims believe. This is what our faith is about. And then as I was writing this, something really profound happened. It real, I, I realized that these are actually things that more Muslims should be thinking about, especially for those of us who are parents, who are educators, who are community leaders, who are khatibs or imams, that we should begin a conversation about our core concepts, our first principles, so that we can better pass them on to our communities, to our families, to our congregations, to our colleagues, to our audiences, what have you, whoever it is, so that we can share what it is we believe and why we believe what we believe. Does that make sense? So I started looking at the concepts, and the one I want to talk about today is one of the main concepts in Islam, which I think is vital to the future of Islam. And that's this, which is sometimes hard for people to hear, but I think is really important. Namely, this idea of khilafa, caliphate. And I don't mean the political caliphate, right? So don't like get too panicked, right? If your heart rate's going up, just let it come down. It's okay. That's not this talk, don't worry. Brother Munir is a little bit concerned. He's like, who did I invite? What is happening here? Where are the exits? Um, fortunately, they're all very clearly marked. Um, khilafa, and, and I'll get into it in more detail, is this Arabic word, it's a feminine word, incidentally. Khalifa is also a feminine word. That means something like a power of attorney. Right, so what's the power of attorney? You need to enter into a contract or, or, or basically something very substantive is happening, you're delegating someone to act on your behalf, right? We do something similar in hospitals, end of life situations, if God forbid someone is really ill, and you say, I appoint this person, it's a proxy to make decisions on my behalf, I have a living will, right? These are ways that we make up for the fact that we might be absent or unable to act. And khilafa in the Islamic concept begins with the khalifa of God, the caliphate, khilafa of Allah, the caliphate of God, the story of Adam and Eve, and I'll get to that in more detail, but effectively it says, Adam and Eve, may God be pleased with them, peace be upon them, and subsequently every human being, including all of us in this room, are khulafa, we are caliphs of God, which means we have been given authority in different ways and forms to live out divine instruction in the world. Another word could be a custodian, a steward, a caretaker. In the old school translations from the 19th, early 20th century, they used words like vicegerent, which nobody has ever used in any other context, so I don't really like that word, because mostly when you say that word, people get very confused. Uh, but that's what happens when you get colonized by the British. Uh, so, you know, and, and what it means is we all have this distinct moral status. And here's what I want to say about the future. The one thing we know about the future, and, and that we've seen just in the last few years with climate change, with COVID, with war in Ukraine, is that we probably don't know what's coming. Somewhat, but a lot of it is unexpected. The world moves faster and changes faster year after year after year. What that means is that no Muslim identity is going to survive unless it comes from a place of deep conviction. And it can only come from a place of deep conviction if we educate and empower as many Muslims as possible, especially young Muslims, to live Islam on their own resources, right? If you teach a kid how to drive, at some point, and there's no formula, you have to let them get on the main road, right? There's no point at which you say, this person is 100% ready. You have to put them in a situation where there is danger. Otherwise, you never master the skill. If you shelter a child excessively, the child will never develop a core faith. And at some point, you will no longer be in the picture, and the child will be on their own resources. And if they don't have a strong sense of faith, the faith will crumble. Communities and institutions will not be enough because we no longer live in a world where religion is inherited. For most people in history, they just did what their parents did. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. That's another debate. I'm just saying that the conditions are changing faster and faster. And so what we need to do for the future of Islam is to focus on the concepts that empower us to get through what is coming. And what that means is less focus on big picture thinking and more focus on smaller communities, local communities, accountability, transparency, and what I call religious confidence. 
the ability to believe that you can live and shape communities on your own. I'm not saying community isn't important, don't get me wrong. I'm saying that when community grows so big that the average person, the average attendee disappears within it and can basically function on autopilot, that community is probably too big. And if people don't have the ability, the confidence to understand that this is their own responsibility, that faith is not going to survive. Does that make sense? So I will give you an example. When I was younger, and unfortunately it seems like this is constantly the case in the Muslim world, there were a number of crises in the Muslim world, right? So I grew up a long, long time ago in the 20th century, and some of the crises that were happening in the 80s and 90s included Kashmir, Palestine, Bosnia, a little bit later Kosovo, Chechnya, right? More recently, there was the war in Syria, there's still Palestine. During that time and now, what's happening to the Uyghur in East Turkestan and Western China, right? These things continue to happen or, or broke out. And often I would hear people say things, if only Muslims were more united. They would even say it's because we're bad Muslims that we're disunited. And certainly there are people who are ostensibly Muslim who are bad actors who don't seem to have the best interests of the Ummah at heart. But one thing I noticed over and over is that even among people who seemed like good religious people, it seemed like the more religious they were, the more they fought. Sometimes, unfortunately, literally, but even in community contexts, otherwise very pious people seem to constantly disagree with each other and couldn't come to terms. And I thought to myself, how can it be that if someone is pursuing the same path and the same discipline, that it makes them more likely than less likely to disagree with each other? And here's what I realized. It's actually a design feature of Islam. And I don't think we fully understand this or the implications. Any faith tradition, any idea, any philosophy, any collective form of life has different values that exist in tension. If you go too far in one direction, you become imbalanced and your society won't survive, right? So if we had a society that focused only on selflessness and had no room for selfishness, then someone would just come along eventually and take everything because there's bad people in the world, right? If you tell someone, never get angry, that's actually terrible advice because someone will come along and take advantage of them. And sometimes anger is righteous. You have to stand up for your rights or the rights of others, right? I'm, you're hurting someone, I'm upset. That doesn't mean you react unthinkingly, but the emotion doesn't have to come from a bad place. But if you only tell people to be angry, right, then you get what we see in a lot of America today, where people are just always angry. And then you can't have a society if people can't forgive each other or see each other as human. Similarly, in the tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him, we see values that pull in different directions. Why? Because sometimes you are poor, sometimes you are rich. Sometimes you were healthy and strong. Sometimes you were frail and ill. And one thing doesn't necessarily apply at the other time, right? If you were strong and powerful, then you, then you should be meek and kind because you can go too far. But if you are weak, physically, socioeconomically, and you embody meekness, that just invites people to take advantage of you. And you see this in simple things like when, you know, for example, the Prophet peace upon him would tell his companions different things in the same situation. Why? Because they were different people. They needed different advice for where they were in life. And we in our religion have something similar. We have on the one hand a narrative that we must be a community, that we are brothers and sisters in Islam. But on the other hand, we have two principles. The first is that all of us are khulafa, we are all caliphs, which means we are all accountable to God. Which means no one can pass the buck to anyone else. No one can shirk their responsibility. And you cannot say on the day of judgment, it's his fault. Right? You have agency. And the second thing is that fundamental to our religion is that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is what? the last prophet. And therefore, after he passes from the world, 
No one can reproduce his authority. If they claim to, then they are effectively saying they are a prophet, which is blasphemy. Which means, if you take these together, the more seriously you take Islam, the more you realize your own accountability, the harder it is to seed ground on an issue that is important to you. I'll give you a simple example. If your family wants to go on vacation, and maybe this is not a problem for you in California, but it seemed like a good example when I was in Ohio, right? Like, and you know, half the family says, we want to go to the mountains, and then half the family says, we want to go to the ocean, right? Unless you have some really pressing reason, probably the adults in the room should be able to figure it out and find a compromise, right? Like, it's not the end of the world. If you could go on vacation, alhamdulillah, it's a great thing, right? So you make the most of it. But imagine a tougher situation. Imagine, for example, you have two kids, One's going to college, and one's a year away from college. And you've planned all along that they're going to go to one of the UC schools. The tuition is, you know, it's, it's more affordable, it's more within reach, it just makes sense. And then you find out your son, your elder son, has gotten into his dream school on the other side of the country, except the financial package isn't that great. And now you're going to sit there and think to yourself, well, you know, we were saving, we were splitting the money between the two kids, and we were doing it half and half. But that was on the assumption that we're going to go to a school nearby where the tuition, because you're in-state, is better, right? But now there's this opportunity far away, but there's all these new costs, and that means dipping into the fund for the other kid. And what do you do in that situation? Right? When there's a lot on the line, it's not easy to agree. Not because you're a bad person, but because there's a lot on the line. And religion is like that. If you are making a choice that you believe has implications for eternity, you're not going to simply say, yeah, sure, we'll just go your way. It's not that easy. Right? If it's what color is the carpet in the masjid, you know, I don't, I imagine that's not really an issue on which the community is going to divide. But if someone says, hey, we have $5,000 to spend this year, and a few people say we should spend the money on education for new Muslims, and someone says, no, we should spend the money on programs for youth, Right? Now you have a harder conversation because they're both good causes. But it's not clear where you, you know, it's not an easy decision. And there's no person in that situation who can tell you decisively what is the right thing to do. You don't actually know. I mean, you have knowledge and information, but there's no conclusive decision. So what I'm trying to say is that it's not surprising that Muslims historically and presently disagree with each other so much because it's part of how our religion functions. The beauty and strength and challenge of Islam is that it doesn't locate authority in a pope or a church or a centralized institution that makes the big decisions for everyone else. It locates authority in every individual. It's liberating and it's terrifying. It's those two things at once. Uh, a, a brother came up to me after the khutbah earlier today uh, at, at San Ramon Valley Islamic Center and said, how do we balance fear and hope? And it's a good question. Because if you have no hope, that's not a good place to be, right? But if you have no fear, you'll be a terrible human being, right? I was talking to someone once, and you know, they were asking, why does religion push you? And I said, well, if you never get pushed, and you just constantly think you're a great person, you would basically be a fascist, right? Like, you would be a terrible human being if your worldview just validated everything you did, right? But if, on the other hand, your religion, as you understood it, demanded so much of you that it was impossible, you would break down. It's a lot like exercise or work. You don't take a 12-year-old and put them in med school, right? Like, that would be a bad idea, especially if you were the patient on the other end of that, right? Also, if you're going to the gym for the first time in 10 years, you don't go do what the guy's doing in the corner who's the trainer unless you talk to the trainer first, right? It's, it's simple. But you also don't sit there and do nothing at all. And so, for us as Muslims, what I am proposing in the book and, and, and thinking about quite a bit is this idea that we need to, as Muslims, lean into, and I'm sorry for the expression, but I couldn't think of a better one, the character of our faith. To accept that disagreement is built into the DNA of Islam. It's, what, it's not actually a weakness, unless you take a very narrow short-term view. It is what has allowed us to survive for centuries unchanged. Sometimes we measure ourselves by other people's standards. We say, why don't Muslims have this? Why don't Muslims have that? Why aren't Muslims like this faith community? Why aren't Muslims like that faith community? Do you know what we have that is amazing? That's effectively impossible to find in any other faith tradition. If a person from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
were to arrive here five minutes before Maghrib, they would probably be very confused. You guys are wearing really weird clothes. You're talking in a language they do not understand, right? There are like weird glowing objects in the ceiling, right? There is cold air blowing out of holes in the wall. It's very strange, right? There's like, there's giant machines like moving around, making loud noise. And I guess unless you have a Tesla, then, you know, they have to like manufacture the noise, but you get it, right? It's a very weird world. A lot of it would seem like magic or insane. It would be very weird. I mean, literally many of the fabrics we're wearing did not exist, right? Let alone like, what the heck is this? And yet, when someone calls the Avan, they know exactly what's happening. Name one other faith tradition in which the forms of worship have survived unchanged from beginning till now. Zero. You can go anywhere in the world, I mean, assuming you have the resources, and go to a masjid and pretty much know what's happening within two minutes. You might not know the language. You might not know the culture. You might say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing in, in little ways, but effectively the worship is almost exactly the same. That's why in the United States, Canada, other countries like immigrant countries with immigrant communities of Muslims, people come from all over the world and pray together with not really that many problems. I mean, yeah, it's like, oh, you put your hands like this, we're like, yeah, like little things here and there, people, you know, like they put their feet on each other's feet, they're like some daisies, we're not like quite as comfortable with that, we're a little bit weirded out, right? But like, you know, 99% of the stuff is basically the same. Why? First of all, why aren't we proud of that? Our theology is the same. No one in first century Christianity had a concept of the Trinity. Literally, historically, did not exist. It's not there. The rabbinic tradition in Judaism did not exist in the time of Moses, for example, and Joshua. Didn't exist. Worship was anchored around the temple in the time of David and Solomon, peace be upon them. It was a different religious tradition. I'm not saying this pejoratively. I'm saying we focus on weaknesses instead of strengths, but what made the strength possible is actually the difference in disagreement because it keeps coming back to individuals. And for some weird reason, we stopped focusing on that as a source of strength and saw it as a form of weakness. And now that we are facing a modern world in which more and more authority will go down to individuals and more and more will come down to local communities, we are pulling in the wrong direction. And if we are worried about kids, and I'm sure probably all of us are in some way, shape, or form, and if you're not, it's because you don't have kids yet, right? And you will the minute you have kids, right? You will start worrying about those things. You have to realize that the only thing that's going to get them through the only thing is by giving them the tools and asking them to walk, to do it on their own. And they may fail. There is no guarantee. I mean, there never was a guarantee anyway. That's not in our hands. The judgment of each is for God and God alone, right? No one can take anyone's agency away. But to simply expect that people will do things because I did things is definitely not going to work anymore. And so the idea in the book, the central idea, is this idea of Khilafah as human agency. That God creates Adam and Eve as caliphs on earth, meaning what? You screw up, you mess up, and you can come back to God, but you will screw up, you will mess up, you will disagree, and yet you can still make it work. What makes an ummah an ummah is not that we are part of the same political formulation or the same ideology and that we march in lockstep. No, it's actually that we agree to have a conversation around the same text. Do you ever try to teach a kid grammar? Right? Like, it's really annoying, right? <laughs> grammar is really frustrating, right? Nobody likes grammar. I'm a writer. I don't like grammar. I don't even know why I write half the things I write. I've just internalized it because of good teachers that, oh, we don't say that, right? If there's a which as opposed to a that, there's a comma before the which, there's no comma before the that. Like, I don't even know why. I just know these things, right? But why is grammar so important? It's the same reason why your Apple Pay counts. It's a shared set of rules that enable us to talk to each other. If I just start spouting gibberish, that's not communication. That's narcissism, right? It's not. And religion, the way our religion functioned is we agree to have a conversation around certain texts. Does that make sense? And the final point I want to make, because I know, I think we're, uh, I don't know, how are we doing on time? We're okay? Awesome, okay. So the final point I want to make um, is that this idea of agency and religion, of, um, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm so excited I'm knocking down my own microphone. Um, it's because the microphone is a khalifa. Um, 
I don't even know what that sentence meant. That's the best part. Um, but it, grammatically, it was correct, so there you understand. So uh, here's the thing. We formed a civilization over centuries where we shared and debated around ideas and beliefs and practices. So the amazing thing is that very early in Islamic history, our ummah was politically fragmented. This is a fact, right? From literally the moments after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, there was disagreement among the companions. Uh, sincere and good people disagreed on what to do next. Uh, by the time of Hazrat Uthman, uh, the third Khalifa, may Allah be pleased with him, there was all out armed conflict between Muslims, right? By the time of Hazrat Ali, may God ennoble him, it's, it escalates and then you have the Umayyads, they take the caliphate and turn it into a monarchy, they move it, you, you know this history, right? And yet the amazing thing is that from, and, and I want you to process this for a moment, in the 1600s, there were organized Muslim commercial expeditions to Ireland and Iceland. There were Muslim surveyors working for the Ottoman Empire in Aceh in Indonesia and in Mozambique in Southeast Africa. And there was a Muslim Khanate, the Sibir Khanate, that bordered the Arctic Ocean. So effectively in what we call the old world, there were Muslim communities in a meaningful sense everywhere. We have from the 16th century evidence reputable, reasonable, comprehensible evidence that Muslim traders in Indonesia traded with the indigenous population of Australia. They were not cut off from the world. Weirdly enough, they never really thought about like killing them all or taking their land. They just did business with them, right? Like what a surprise, right? Like what a novel idea. And yet they were not, these Muslim communities were not part of the same political entity and yet they shared ideas, poetry, language, they worshiped together at Hajj, Right? They were part of a shared space. Trying to force political unity would have actually caused more disagreement and more dissension and more harm, but the texts and the ideas and the practices were shared in such a way that produced a world in which you and I live where the core concepts of Islam are unchanged from the beginning. Which is itself, it's from God, but God had the wisdom to create for us a faith that enables it to survive in different times and places. And what I want to say then as, as a final point is that I talked in the beginning about frameworks, right? If you start with an assumption, your mode of thinking isn't necessarily different, right? So this, this is simple, right? If, you know, you see someone wearing something that triggers a feeling in you, your way of engaging with that person may be different. Now, to someone else, they'd be like, why is this person being so hostile or being so skeptical or something like that, right? They, they get very confused, this and that. So, you know, I've, I've had this interesting experience in my life where I sometimes am ethnically ambiguous, right? So people think I'm different things, right, depending on where I am. So I, I went to Miami a few years ago for a program with a Muslim community down there, and everyone assumed I was Latino, and I'm not. Nothing wrong with that, I'm just not. And so people would start speaking to me in Spanish. And then I would say, I'm sorry, I, I don't speak Spanish. I took five years, but Mrs. Zimmering in like 10th grade, summer's high school, just couldn't cut it. And my Spanish is like, just garbage, right? So like, I, and, and some people got offended and thought I was like a self-hating Latino, right? Like that I just, I'm ashamed of my identity. I don't know, I'm not ashamed of my identity. I just, you know, also my Urdu is terrible, but that's another story, right? But so there's the theme, I guess. So maybe they were finding something. But here's my point. The information you have shapes your, your approach on things. And sometimes we have this tendency to see Islam and the West as opposites, right? Muslim culture and American culture as two different things. And actually there is this tremendous overlap. And I don't just mean in the obvious fact that we are Americans and we identify as Americans, we live in America and all, you know, all of these things that are surprising to some people in, in, on some news channels, right? What I mean is that American philosophy, Western philosophy, starts with this idea. The American tradition especially, that rights come from God. And so government can't take them away. You know, I'm from New England, 
And I have a, a baseball cap. Uh, I feel kind of terrible because I wore it to a Muslim conference recently in Texas where there were a lot of British Muslims. And it's a colonial era slogan. And then the queen died. And I felt like maybe it was a little bit like, eh, you know, a little cringy. Like, I'm sorry. But fortunately, they didn't know. When, before the, the, the flag that we know as the American flag was designed, American colonists in New England marched to battle with a flag that had a tree on it that said, appeal to heaven. Why? Because the authority everyone imagined supreme was the king. In every European society, the king is appointed by God. So they said, we are appealing to God over the king. And we have a right to be heard because we are asking God, not the king, and the king can't stop us. So they articulated, and it leads from there directly to the Declaration of Independence, that these rights are inalienable. And so in the foundation of America, you have an idea that is similar. It's different texts, different sources, but there's a similarity that's really important. That rights are from God, and you're not supposed to pass them off on anyone. You're not supposed to deprive anyone of them. We have a similar concept, that we are all khulafa. We are all created by God for a reason, and we are held accountable for what we do. What is now missing in American society is that we are losing ethical traditions, whether they are faith traditions or otherwise, that emphasize that rights are responsibilities. I don't mean in the sense of imposition. I'm not arguing for that. I think, you know, especially for minority, but not only for minority, a pluralistic and neutral state is ideal. What I mean is that if you can't govern yourself through individually and as communities, you will have a dictatorship or you will have chaos. And it is not coincidental that Islam traditionally doesn't like either of those things. And what we are losing in America is a narrative that emphasizes, emphasizes our ability to restrain ourselves. And this is not a left or right thing. I see this, frankly, in a lot of parts of American society as hedonism. This idea that limits are artificial and unhealthy, whether that is in terms of how we conceive intimacy with other people or how we use resources, the idea that there should be limits, that there should be temperance, that there should be modesty and humility is seen as anathema. It's offensive. And yet, if you cannot limit yourself, someone will have to come in and limit you. And that person will not have your best interests at heart. And so I think that we need as a community to, one, focus on our first principles in order to pass them on to those who come after us, who will have to succeed after us, right? At some point in the relatively near future, none of us in this room will be in the world anymore. And whether this room is still used for a halakha or what have you is up to the people who come after and that's partially our responsibility, although we are not wholly accountable for it, but we have to make an effort. The second thing is, those principles are not identities or ethnicities or cultures. They are moral values. And therefore, they are for all people. And we should be, and I'm not saying this to your community specifically, from everything I've seen, you have a wonderful community, I mean just Muslims generally, need to be a little bit more confident. Instead of defending our faith, we should be articulating how our faith can be lived out in the world, and not just by us. How our values are of benefit, especially now in an America that seems to have lost its mind in a kind of zero-sum contest between left and right. There is a need for alternate ways of looking at the world. And if we allow ourselves to be caught in a spiral of polarization, and I hear this often, you know, Muslims should be Democrats, or Republican values, or Muslim values. No, a 1,400-year-old civilization that is meant for all times and places cannot be limited to one of two political parties in a brief moment in time in one corner of the world. We are bigger than that. We have broader horizons. We can't be limited. And the third and final thing is a culture of moral restraint is not just good for your soul, it's good for our society. And we should share that and build on. And so I am actually cautiously optimistic for the future. I think we will have enormous challenges. I think it will be difficult. I think that some of the decisions we have made as collectively mean we will lose people along the way because we didn't invest in the right things or the right places. But our faith is not controlled by us. 
in the sense that it is given by God and it is secured by God, just like the Qur'an is protected by God. And if you make an effort, that effort is rewarded. And that comes down to, I think, over and over again, this idea of khalifa, of being a caliph, of standing up and being a grown-up. And we don't do enough of that. We have an American culture that lives in a kind of permanent adolescence, that's afraid of responsibilities. And what khulafa really are are people who are willing to take responsibility. Uh, so with that, I will close. I thank you for your time. And uh, I believe we have space for questions. Just let me know if you have uh, your hands up and I'll come over with the mic. Uh, we'll have to use the mic because there's people watching online, inshallah. Just raise your hand, inshallah. That means I did a very good job. He did an excellent job. People are like, what is he talking about? <laughs> oh, there's a question right here. Oh, there's a question there, too. All right, I'll go to the sisters first. Just Jazak Allah for oh, yeah. that insightful talk. So you're, I read your book. It gives me a lot of hope in the chaos that's surrounding us. If you had to give advice to a younger Harun, or let's say my children, of two things that we need to think about when we are presenting Islam to the Western world in, in our schools or in our workplace, or how do we, the way you say that we need to present it with confidence. What does, does confidence look like? That is a great question. Uh, so I will say, that, to me, confidence implies two things, calm and courage. And so a person who frenetically responds to events, instead of thinking about where they want to be and how to get there, is not acting from a place of confidence. And we as a community often react, uh, and, and this is not, I'm not blaming us you know, like we live in a world that, that invites us to respond to everything at all times, right? That's one of the wonderful gifts of instant communication, right? But if you are constantly responding, you are not actually planning anything. You are not building anything. You are not focusing. So I think a framework that allows us to withdraw, that doesn't demand being pulled into everything, is part of confidence. And courage implies taking a leap, a leap of faith. Uh, I read a great book recently by a gentleman named Russ Roberts, who is a former U Chicago economist. And it's called Wild Problems. It's a very slim book. And he basically says, why is it, one, so hard for people to make difficult decisions? And two, why are economists so bad at helping people make difficult decisions, right? And, and what he says effectively, and he uses Darwin as an example, and it's actually quite a funny book, that we misunderstand big decisions. So he says, for example, one of the most common decisions people face is, should I get married? Or should I have kids? And he says, this is what Darwin did. And don't raise your hand if this is you, but if you know it, just feel shame inside. He made a chart and said pros and cons, right? And literally, should I get married, right? And he was like, someone to talk to, right? <laughs> like, I get bored, right? Like, cons, won't be able to do as much research, right? might get annoying, right? Like, not even kidding, right? Like, you know, like, actually, because he, he's like, he's a rigorous scientist. He wants to spell everything out. And he says, what's the problem with that? I mean, it seems logical, right? Like, if you say, should I live in Chicago or should I live in San Diego, right? Like, you can make a list, right? Like, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. You know, I, you make a list, right? He's like, some problems are different because when you come out the other side, you are not different in terms of how you use your time. You are a different person. He said, so ask anyone who is a parent. Even when you're miserable, your sense of self is completely different. Because you're a parent. He gives an example. Uh, if you take a purely utilitarian calculus, voting is a waste of time. Your vote doesn't really count. I mean, you're in California, it definitely doesn't count, right? Like, I'm not, like, you know, I mean, if you think about it, as long as enough people vote, like, let's say you're, you're on the left, right? As long as enough people vote, that candidate will win the state. Why should you waste your day? You're better off making a few hundred dollars, you know, renting out your car 
or I don't know, whatever, right? Like doing some deliveries or something, right? And, and rationally makes sense. But he says, no, people get offended because voting is fundamental to their identity. I am a citizen. This matters. Even if it doesn't matter, right? In a, in a numerical sense, it matters existentially. And, and what I will give you this as, as an example, and, and I'm sort of going a little bit farther afield, but, you know, if you think about marriage, if you think about parenting, people don't think that on the other side you are a different person. And it's not about, you know, oh, I'll have less time to watch Netflix, which, by the way, you will, right? But it won't even matter. The things that on that side mattered seem kind of weird on the other side. And vice versa. You change who you are as a person. And so for me, confidence is the calm, the, willing to be, the willingness to take the world slowly, not to rush into things, because you don't, we don't know how significant a thing is unless we're able to step back from it and try to appraise it with some, you know, with peace of mind. If we're constantly pulled in one direction or another, we're not thinking rationally. And, and we see a lot of this in American culture now. We just jump from cause to cause without, and, and one thing I will say for Republicans that they've done very well is they act politically disciplined, right? Whatever you think about Roe v. Wade, they've been working on that for decades, right? Like the gritty, boring work of sitting there and making like voter lists that is not glamorous or exciting, they're doing it. Right? It's patience. I'm not saying that therefore calm itself is, you know, enough. And then the second thing is courage is the willingness to step in and do things. And not in a way that's irresponsible, but the willingness to challenge yourself. I will say for me, so I'm, I'm a stepdad, the biggest change in my life came in becoming a stepparent. And I could not have imagined before and after how big the shift was. Because it's not simply that, oh, I have a new responsibility as in, you know, I got like a new portfolio at work. No, it's like my fundamental sense of self and my relationship to time and existence and eternity is changed. And so to me, what we need from Muslim communities is a little bit more focus on the local, a little bit more focus in general, and a willingness to make hard choices. Not recklessly, but not in the sense of simply passively sitting there and letting the world go by. At some point, you have to enter into the arena, right? It doesn't mean you enter into every fight and, and get into every argument. I don't know if that answers your question, but to me, that, that is part of it. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. I think there were a few more questions. Oh, this is very good chai. I don't know where uh, the brother is who made the chai, but it, it's good chai. Yeah, I'll be awake till Thursday now. Uh, I was curious, given your uh, philosophy background um, and given, obviously, the the nature of the book, if you were ever, when you were writing it, tempted to start leaning into, like, political philosophy and critiquing it and critiquing, like, forms of government. How do you mean? Say more. What was that? Sorry? How do you mean? Like, so I, um, it's, it's been a, re like, recent interest of mine, like, political philosophy, despite sure. the fact that I graduated microbiology from college. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, sort of looking at a macro level of um, how sometimes different forms of government are, aren't actually compatible with uh, different belief systems. And so I was curious, sure. you know, th th the sense that I get from this book is that it's a very sort of like individual, like focusing on your sort of inner self, your, your local self, if you will. And I was wondering if in the course of you writing this book, if you were ever tempted to address sort of the macro level of things, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that absolutely makes sense. So I've been thinking about this a lot. It's not in the book. So the book actually was pretty much finished before COVID started. Uh, it was delayed a little bit because of COVID. Uh, in the process, became a step parent. A lot of things that were more abstract in the book became like very immediate and impactful. And then other things that I thought were important felt relatively less important. But one thing I've been thinking about a lot recently is, so, you know, I live in Ohio, as I've mentioned, right? And um, it's a wonderful place to live. Um, but I lived in New York City for a long time and, and lived in a very coastal bubble. I grew up in New England, lived in New York. Um, I imagine you all are in your own coastal bubble. Congratulations. It's very nice. Um, at least you have palm trees. So here's the thing. Um, I was initially really surprised by how many Muslims support Trump. Uh, it's actually a very large number. Right? I don't know what the landscape is here. Again, you know, different communities, different places. Um, but certainly where I am and in many other Muslim communities, there are large numbers of Muslim voters for Trump. 
And that's people who are self-reporting, right? So there's probably even more. They're just at this point still hesitant to say. And you know, I, I was curious to investigate why, right? Because I I see strengths in in conservative and liberal narratives, and I see weaknesses. I, I put Trump aside as as a uniquely problematic phenomenon insofar as he does not support constitutional democracy. Uh, so I see that as a uh, uh, a fundamentally un-American concept, right? As to whether you're Republican or, or Democrat, to me that's a, a legitimate political conversation, you know, that you know we could have all day or, or all year, whatever. Um, but I just I, I wanted to make that clear for what comes next. So what I noticed is that among you know some Muslims it was purely fiscal, you know, like lower taxes and that. But a lot of them focused on social issues, right? Their values are closer to my values. And you know the question I often ask is which values, right? Like it, I don't think it maps out that neatly, right? Um, and, and so, you know, but I, I like exploring these questions and, and where I think we as a country have to really go is I think that faith and morality are, are best left to it, spiritual and religious questions left to local communities in a democracy like ours. And government is better off focusing on issues that we can work together on. Uh, so infrastructure, uh, healthcare, uh, climate resilience, so on and so forth. Um, that's not political philosophy in any deep sense. I just, I think that for a long time as Muslims, we've focused on big picture thinking without focusing on the local. And, and in so doing, I think it's very, to, to kind of your question, it's very easy to put the cart before the horse and, and get too far ahead of ourselves, as I may have done in that question. So, yeah. okay, thank you, thank you. Um, this is really insightful. Thank you. Um, my question is really around the idea of starting with your local community. Could you tell us some tangible examples of what that could look like, or do you have communities in mind that have done really well in mm. this area? Yeah, so I will give you a, a personal example. Uh, something a sheikh once said to me, uh, which I think was very profound, is you should have multiple teachers. And I have translated that to mean that you should have multiple sources of your faith. And the reason is because um, if you put all your eggs in one basket, um, that basket may break. And often what I've seen in, in Muslim kids who grow up in very narrowly religious households where they are not allowed to have interests outside of strictly Muslim ones is they lose their faith like that. Because if you have invested everything into one thing and you have no other outlet, then if you are struck by some kind of calamity, right, personally, communally, institutionally, you have nothing to fall back on. You have no social networks, you have no friendships or relationships, you have no consciousness of the world beyond the very thing that has hurt you. And so that can mean abuse, that can mean, uh, you know, uh, behavior that is unethical, uh, that can simply mean a divorce, uh, whatever it is, there is no, there's nowhere to go. And so everything falls apart because it's sort of like, uh, you know, it's like if you cut the end of your thespi, all the beads fall off, right? Because there's nothing holding them in place anymore. And, and so what I've taken that to mean is that every person should have multiple sources of faith because it makes your faith more resilient, right? In the same way that, you know, you should not take your news from one source, right? I'm not saying you should take your news from anywhere, but, you know, um, it... You know, you should not have one type of friend. You should not have only one friend. You know what I mean? Like, that friend may be busy, that sort of thing. So, you know, as an example, um, when I was at NYU, when we were very young, um, I was 21, 9-11 happened. We were the largest Muslim community in proximity to Ground Zero. And we had fortunately started giving our own khutbas. And the... The day after, you know, our leadership team met and said, at this point, we cannot allow anyone to speak in the masjid. Like, we don't even know what's happening, but we can guess. We cannot allow anyone to speak in the uh, musalla unless we know who they are intimately. And we, we know they have our best interests at heart. Now, this was a very difficult decision to make because none of us were in the traditional sense like shiuch. We, didn't, we were not traditional scholars. And yet we understood that given the, the paucity, the, the dearth of qualified people who were competent people, right? Just because you know how to give a khutbah doesn't mean you should give the khutbah, right? Um, we, we had no other choice. 
And what I mean to say is that, you know, kids should learn these things, right? You should know how to give a khutbah, right? It's really weird that we don't teach that. You should know how to speak publicly. You should know how to, like, balance an account, right? I don't know why we don't do more practical knowledge even in a religious space, right? I'll give you a simple example. Um, when, when I moved to Ohio, um, you know, I got married recently. Um, we live in a multi-generational household, so my wife's parents are with us. We're all together, right? And we didn't go to the, the Eid Namaz, the Eid Salah, uh, the, the first year of COVID because we were we thought, like, at this point there were vaccinations, so we were, like, better to be on the safe side, right? And this was very hurtful because it was sort of like, does this mean we're never going to the masjid? And so we did our own Eid Salah, right? I don't, like, again, I don't know the validity. I mean, it was sort of an extreme circumstance, but this happens. People go to places where there is no masjid or, you know, they're not welcome in the masjid. So there are two masjids in proximity to us, right? And one of them is a much bigger kind of stereotypically suburban masjid, and um, when I can, I take the kids there. That's where I often go, although the parking lot is a bit of a disaster, so sometimes you just, you don't have enough time to get in and out, so I go to another masjid. But the other masjid puts women behind a wall, and I refuse to take our daughters there. I believe I have to go there, and, and this is my own calculation, that I, Jummah is an obligation I owe to God. Even if I don't like the way the masjid is doing it, I have to do it, right? But I don't think that they should be in that space don't think it's respectful to them, especially at this point, as, as young women who are, who are developing a faith identity, I don't want them to associate their faith with being behind a wall. I think that's obscene, right? It's completely unnecessary. And, um, you know, so that's my point, right? So it's, you know, if you are in a situation, what do you do if that's the only masjid, right? What do you do if the, the masjid is simply too far away? And, you know, these are little things. And even, you know, it's not even that, right? Like, um, I'm sure every family's practice, we try to pray maghrib together every night. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't work because timing, this and that, but we try, right? And I often encourage um, the kids to do dua, and my wife does as well afterwards. So our youngest, he leads the prayer, and then we often ask the girls to lead the dua. Why? Because we tell them, we don't want you to think that because you're women, you don't have a role. And we want our son to know that, like, just because you can lead the dua, and he does a really good job, I'll be honest. So Reza, if you're listening, go to bed. Um, East Coast time, I don't know what's happening. But... You know, he does a great du'a, but we also want him as a young man to be conscious that if you are in a leadership position, you should be conscious of everyone else in the room and bringing them in. You know, that doesn't mean that, like, they're going to go ahead and form a community, but, like, your family is a community, right? Like, some people are blessed to be able to go to the masjid all the time. A lot of people, it's really far away, or their job doesn't permit it. You know, like, they, maybe they're working two jobs, or they don't have enough cars, I mean, whatever it is, right? You can pray at home. But you should have the confidence to know how to pray at home, right? You should have the confidence to know how to do a dua. And everyone has different levels of capability, but that gets to the point of confidence. I don't mean confidence in, like, go, like, give a fatwa, right? Like, if you can't do it, you shouldn't do it. But, like, there are certain kinds of religious practice that you should be able to do on your own. And I think one of the beautiful things about Islam as a religion, and, and this to me is evidence of the fact that it's universal, is we have, like, the most Spartan faith in the world. You really need almost nothing to do your Muslimness. Right? Like a clean place on the ground and like enough clothing. I mean, you don't need like an elaborate structure. You don't even really need a prayer rug. Right? I mean, you kind of need to know where the sun is, but I mean, the sun is kind of always there. Right? Like, it's like, <laughs> you don't have to carry the sun with you, right? It's kind of amazing. It's a very portable religion that before the modern world and people thought nothing of traveling thousands of miles, religion was given to people who thought nothing of traveling thousands of miles. So I don't know if that answers your question, but, but hopefully it does, yeah. Also, I, I really recommend the chai. You should have a cafe. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? We well, do have one question online. Maybe we oh, can okay. answer that, inshallah. Sure. So the question is, um, how can we make our Muslim organizations more diversified? How can we have women on the board, African Americans on the board? So I'm a, a bit of a um, heterodox thinker on this one. Uh, and, and let me explain myself because I don't want to be misunderstood. I think it is fine if people want to form a community that holds to their particular understanding of Islam, right? I, I do not believe in imposition. I don't believe in forcing open spaces. My response to that, to, to one of the earlier questions, is the, the right response is to empower people to create communities that they feel comfortable in, right? And then you work together where you can, and you agree to disagree if we're lucky, you know, where you can. So, you know, for example, um, you know, where I live, there is a new community, immigrant community, that's growing in numbers and in wealth, and they have decided to build their own masjid. Now, maybe that's not a bad, like, they're not going with the masjid that exists, that they attend right now, they're building their own. 
Maybe that's not a bad thing because you can't fit that many people in a masjid anyway, right? Like, I don't know. But, you know, like, for example, there are ethnic groups that have gone through severe trauma, right? Like genocides, ethnic cleansing. If they want an ethnically tailored masjid, I mean, I'm Punjabi. There's like 200 million of us. Like, I don't feel endangered, right? And I don't mean that flippantly, right? Like, if you come from a culture that has been persecuted and attacked and you want to preserve your culture in the name of religion... I mean, it's a little bit, there's some tension there, but I, I, I can't say I don't understand the impulse, right? It's, it's normal for human beings to want to continue their culture, and there's nothing by that fact alone un-Islamic about it. Um, but what I think is, to, to your questions, is we should enable people to found their own spaces. Now, what I do say is that, look, if our religion has certain features, then we should accommodate them in different ways. So, for example, most Muslims, you know, the vast majority believe that a mixed gender prayer should be led by a man, right? So our imams are men, right? So that means that you have an imbalance. So what you should do is you should work into the administrative structure of the masjid uh, a balancing effect, right? So the president of the masjid should be a woman, or the chairman of the board should be a woman. Or, you know, there should be a female scholar in residence to balance out the imbalance, right? So if the vast majority of your population are, you know, let's say of a certain ethnic group, right? And as a Pakistani, it's like often we tend to like ruin everything with our prodigious growth rate, right? But, you know, there are just a lot of Pakistanis, right? Okay, so you have to actively seek out ways to involve and engage other communities. That can mean term limits. That can mean, you know, creating youth chairs and, you know, I mean, and this is, there's ways to do this that are creative. If you can't do it, if you can't break through and, and that happens and there's reasons, or you simply don't see eye to eye, right? Like, you know, there are Muslim communities where, for example, um, they don't believe from their understanding of fiqh that the khutbah should be in English. Now, if someone really believes that, that is their, that is their right. I can't force someone to do something that they don't think is right. But what I can do is encourage people to start their own masjid. And I don't mean that in the sense of creating fitna. I'm simply saying that's, if that's how you want to do it, then that's how you should do it. I don't, I don't believe that we have to force things. So if there is a Sunni community and a Shia community, like people don't have to abandon their commitments to, be, to work together. That's kind of strange. And from a democratic culture, that's very strange, right? We can work together all the time. People do it all the time, right? People form lines at stores. People, like, figure out how a four-way intersection works, right? This is totally normal. You can, like, you can find ways to cooperate, and if they don't, they don't work. And, and that's simple, you know? It's the same with Sunday school. If someone is passionate about believing that the Sunday school should focus on hif, for example, on memorization, and some other folks are passionate that it should focus on no, you know, X, Y, and Z, then you don't have to agree, Right? I, I think that there's actually strength in that because then one of the advantages is then the next generation has a community that has skills distributed more equally and more meaningfully. Does that make sense? So it might in the short term feel bad, but in the long term it actually resonates. Um, you know, a, a friend of mine, um, and, and you know, this, so a friend of mine was visiting, he's an imam, he was visiting uh, the Netherlands. And he was taken on a tour of one of the Muslim neighborhoods. And he had the great, it was so funny. I don't think he meant it as sort of a profound statement, but it came out that way. He was going through the neighborhood, and there were two masjids, like, side by side. And so the, tour, the, the guide said, this is the Moroccan masjid, and that's the Turkish masjid. And so my friend, like, he doesn't mean it offensively. He goes, so where do the Dutch Muslims go? Right? And then there was a moment of awkward silence. Like, nobody had thought about this. Right? But, you know, I mean, let's say, you know, a large number of white Americans convert to Islam and they don't necessarily fit into an ethnic masjid. That's fine. You can have their own masjid, right? And then you, like many people, like different masjids do Eid namaz together, right? They do an Eid celebration together. It's totally fine. I don't, that's me personally. I don't have a problem with that. It doesn't bother me as a Muslim. I think that's simply the way Islam works. And that was what I was saying in the talk is that when you have a, if you believe you're accountable to God, then you are making the best decision. It's no different than the fact that in this room, you know, I'm assuming we're all Muslim. Many folks are parents. If you ask nitty gritty questions on parenting styles, you'll probably butt head. No one believes that like someone should come in and say, no, your parenting is wrong. I will parent your children. Right? That's just very strange. Right? It's the same thing with communities. This is this is the community, this is how it works, it grows, it changes. If it doesn't accommodate you, you know, you have one foot in maybe and one foot in another space. That works? Awesome. I feel like I'm answering a question to a laptop. It's a very strange sensation. Yeah. Um, oh, two questions. Very exciting. Being a parent and uh, also 
being inheriting or having inherited the religion itself, I felt like over the last decade or so, it's been more of like a learning journey for myself to rediscover religion for what it means. And I thought when you talked about in the Juma Khutbah around the beauty of Islam and how it's very different was something that I feel like I'm discovering now. And as I think about educating kids, my kids, on what the religion can mean, and especially contextualizing it the way you'd put it, as teaching them how to do dua or lead khutbahs or th those kind of things, I feel like even I don't know how to do that, right? Let alone teaching my kids how to do that. Uh, do you think there's a space in the community and the educators within the community should be taking the initiative to at least guiding parents, if not children, to, to do that more so, so then we can propagate that further? Because I feel like the point is great, I don't think our community lacks resources. Like, I struggle finding Muslim storybooks mm -hmm. in the libraries or even otherwise, right? So that's just a starting point, and I feel like the resources are very scarce, good quality resources. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think, you know, this is, this is the beautiful thing about communities, right? That no one person embodies in themselves everything, right? So uh, a community functions, you know, when you have a diversity, you know, to the point on diversity, diversity of experiences and talents, right? So, you know, for example, yeah, I, I teach some of these things, but that's where I chose to concentrate my time and energy, right? Like, I'm a person who did Islamic studies in graduate school, so it's a, it's a different trajectory, right? But everyone brings something to the table in, in, in more ways than one. So, for example, um, the youth program at our local masjid is run by uh, a young gentleman uh, who is actually a soccer coach at a local college, and he's quite talented. And so he has a knack for knowing how to motivate kids, right? Like, you don't want to watch me play sports. It's like an insult to many levels of existence, right? Like, that's just not, you know, what I did. But I'm with you, I, I learn a lot of things. And, you know, I, one of the things I really regret, I was, as you probably tell, a very bookish kid, right? Like, and, you know, when I was growing up, the jock nerd thing was like really real, right? So like, either you were a jock or you were a nerd, right? So either you played sports or you read books and there was very little overlap. And then the people who did overlap were the worst people in the world. Cause it's like, how can you be smart and good at sports? That's not fair, right? Also this one friend, Mark Martinez, in case he's watching, he was like really good looking, like, um, like super muscular, great at sports and like really smart and the nicest guy in the world. And it's like, what am I supposed to hate about you, right? Like you, like, you don't have anything wrong here, right? Like, what is, like, how is that fair, right? So other than Mark, right, as that one example of a problem, right? Like, here's the thing. I actually learned a lot too. Like, you know, the kids are very into sports and that's actually encouraged me to start going to the gym. One, to keep up, right? But two, also as a recognition, like that's a part of my life that I'm missing, right? And, you know, I like the fact that the masjid has all these sports programs. But then I'm also conscious that there are a lot of kids who don't play sports. And so where does their point of entry? So everyone has something they can offer in some way, shape, or form and contribute to the community in whatever way it is. You know, having doctors around is an immense benefit, right? Like I, I really do wonder in a country like ours, and I'm saying this fully recognizing how incredibly privileged it makes me sound, like as a Desi from a certain generation, like every other person I know is a doctor, right? But like really, I mean, you know, if there's a problem, you have 10 people to call, like right there on your phone, who can prescribe medication, come in, see a kid. And for a lot of Americans who don't have that, like imagine how terrifying the world is. You don't know any doctors, you may not even have health insurance. So what I'm trying to say, long story short, is I don't think it's about focusing like, oh, you don't know how to do this. Like I do think the community should provide those resources, but it's also like, what can you provide? And I'm sure there's lots of things you can provide that other people cannot provide. And it's about creating a more resilient community and connecting to kids in ways that help them feel like meaningfully engaged and involved, right? So to me, that's, that's what it means is modeling a sense of Muslimness, right? That is confident, that is comfortable in the world, and that has room for different kinds of people. You know, that can be a writer, that can be a doctor, that can be an entrepreneur, that can be a VC person, that can be, you know, a house husband or a housewife, whatever it is, there's something that that person has to contribute. And a strong community is one that finds ways to pull those people in and say, how can you then give back, share this knowledge, share this expertise? One of the coolest things, um, and I'm sure a lot of colleges do this everywhere, when we were doing this when we were very young in the, in the late 90s, is like professional panels, you know? And it's, you know, that's really impactful. And oftentimes, I will say, if it comes from someone other than the parent, the kids are more likely to take it seriously, right? When the parent says it's like, yeah, whatever, right? Like, that's not, we don't believe you. Um, but then someone else comes and says, so I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. 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 Thank you for the uh, beautiful uh, 
lecture. Thank you. Um, I haven't read the book, but I'm looking forward Neither to it, inshallah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my question actually touches on a lot of the recent questions as well, which is the generational uh, advancement of Islam in, let's take our country, for example, the US. Because people coming from, I, I, I came, migrated actually so I'm like I consider myself like zero generation but I have kids the first generation yeah my wife actually was the first generation because her dad is the one who migrated okay. so so we have so, but um, in, in kind of like again this is I think common in all of our communities should we and, and related to to the topic of your of your book as well so uh, um, some of us were came or whatever some of the folks came migrated either they're really like um, fleeing from persecution or or trying to find like the, the freedom because the freedom is not there sure, in, in sure. many Islamic countries yeah. and some of them come and just okay they, they know that they carrying a message to deliver or whatever some very 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 limited if I will but um, but the point here about this the first and second and third and fourth generation which is gonna come which is start appearing right now there are a lot of these should so do you recommend that the culture come with the folks and, and should like prevent teaching cultures at all and let the, the new generations live the, the, the life of their community here and, and just be historyless from, from what the culture came in because some of, a lot of negative uh, um, um, things came from whatever overseas. Or should we still keep some of those cultures wherever and, and, and so the recommendation is, should we teach the Islam as an absolute or keep in our communities in an absolute Islam and try to really prevent any culture, uh, cultural um, uh, uh, impact or preferences or should we take a little bit of here and here and there? So that's yeah. if you can touch on. Thank you. Yeah, that's, a, that's a light question. So I appreciate um, a soft, yeah. <laughs> an, an easy question. No, alhamdulillah, that's a good question. So I will say a few things, and again, I'm saying this not as a sheikh, so I'm just telling you as someone just, you know, who thinks about these things a lot. Um, so take that with a, a grain of salt or, or whatever uh, spice you prefer. Um, so here's the thing. If you don't have a sense of hope for the future, you're not going to flourish. But if you are not anchored to the past, you're not going to flourish either. You need two wings to fly. And so kids do need a sense of where they come from. Not, if it limits them, it's dangerous, but it gives them a sense of solidity and history and belonging, it's meaningful. So I don't believe, I mean, uh, let me put it this way. There are kind of three in my, like very, I, I'm actually writing on this right now. Um, there's, three, th there's three kind of ways in which Islam asks us to submit, right? There's one way in which we have very little freedom of operation. That's like ibadat, right? You have to pray, right? You don't really have a lot of room for, you know, how, right? There's some, I mean, you know, like, for example, if you're a man, you know, these parts of your body should be covered. Nobody's saying, like, you have to wear a shawar kameez or a thob or, you know, that's up to whatever. I mean, you know, if it's cold, it's raining, whatever, right? But, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 Yeah, how you pass it on. Yeah, okay, I understand your question better now. So I will say I don't think that, I think that, let me put it this way. We should teach people how to do things when they are young, right? Like if any of you is like over 30 and has tried to learn a language, it's really hard. And if you watched a five-year-old learn a language, it's like painful to watch because it's so easy. It's like your, your brain is like, why, right? And, and there's something to that, right? So that's the wisdom of classical education is you teach the laws. You don't teach creative thinking at five. There's nothing to create, right? Like you're not that smart, right? Like you're five, right? You're a kid. You have to learn the foundation. 
then you play with the concepts as you mature, right? It's the same with writing. If you don't know grammar, you're never going to be a good writer. But if you only stick to grammar, you will be a boring writer, right? So I am a big believer that we should teach kids how to do things. But I always say, I mean, Allahu Alam, I don't know, like we're all kind of just trying to figure this out as well. I say, I say to them, I'm teaching you how to do it so that when you go out into the world, if you want to choose this path, and I would be sad if you didn't, but, but it's not my choice, it's your choice, and you have to answer for it, then you at least know how. I'm giving you the tools, right? It's the same way as saying if you teach a kid how to drive. I'm teaching you how to drive because it's important. What you choose to do with that car, ultimately, I can't control, right? Like, I can tell you I will be upset if X, Y, and Z happens, right? But I, I am literally giving you the ability to drive away, right? If you go to college somewhere far away, nobody's monitoring you. So I can teach you, like, how to find the qibla. I can teach you what times to pray. I can give you resources so that if you choose to do that, it is easy. But the choice is yours. I think it is, it, we have to strike a middle way. If we don't emphasize it, what we are saying is it's not important. And if it's not important, you won't, and many kids come back to it, I will say that. Many kids in their early, like late teens, early 20s drift away. That's, I think that's quite normal, right? Especially in this culture in this time. But they come back as the responsibilities of life become real. Like, oh, now I have a baby. Like, oh my God, right? What do I do with this? Your whole, like I said earlier with Russ Roberts, the book, your whole sense of self changes. If you don't have the tools, you are walking around blind, right? My hope is the ideas sink in, they make sense, and they, they come back to the surface over time. Some kids, mashallah, they just, they're very diligent, they're very good, and they stick with it. Some really struggle, and we respect the struggle, right? It's the same thing in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. I mean, literally the Prophet was right there, and some people took like 15 years to convert. And some people heard it once and they, you know, they were like, this is different personalities, right? And some people never did. And, and that's as painful as it is, that's a possibility. There will be kids of Muslim families who choose not to be Muslim. We live in a pluralistic society, that's reality. If we push it too hard, they will associate it with imposition, not with choice. And that's dangerous. But if we don't emphasize it, then what we're saying is it doesn't matter. You know, like, it, it's, it's meaningless. Like, I will tell you this, this thing that really struck me, and at first I was, like, proud, and then I was terrified because I realized the hubris. Cincinnati is a very Catholic town, city, whatever. Um, very, the original kind of white population was very German Catholic, Italian, that kind of thing. So, like, your parish, this and that, like, really matters, right? So, um, the, the Catholic schools all play each other in sports all the time. And, you know, the kids love to go to the games because they're, like, big events. You know, like, it's like when you were growing up sports, you know, rivalries and stuff were a big deal. So I went to one of the games and I sat far away so I don't embarrass the children, right, you know, and vice versa, I suppose. Um, and the Catholic school, so they start with a prayer and they start with the national anthem. Well, the prayer of the national anthem, right? So in the name of the Father, you know, so on and so forth. And then they cross themselves, the parents. About 60, 50, 60 percent of the parents cross themselves. Guess how many kids did? And the vast majority of kids are Catholic. Guess how many kids did? Guess. Zero. Not one. Why? I don't know. My guess is the parents have confused socializing with Catholics for Catholicism. So they have like, you know, a Catholicism of, you know, cultural institutions, things. And that's fine. That's how some people do it. That's totally fine. But if the idea is to pass on faith, I don't know. And maybe it's just you're in high school, it's weird, right? So like you don't want to be the one person who does it. You actually do do it, but you don't want to do it in front of other people. Like, those are all legitimate questions. And our community is not somehow magically immune to the same trends that are we live in the same society, right? But it is interesting to think about that faith identity is something that is very hard to know how to pass on. Because if you push it hard and it's forced and imposed, it's not a choice. And then the second thing I will say is that if you are given freedom to test the boundaries a little bit when you're at home, you don't lose your mind. But if your first experience of freedom is when you were in college and you can do real damage to yourself, it's a lot more dangerous. So there is something I think to be said for, you know, saying like, yeah, you know, this is a choice. I'm not going to, you know, like force things on, you know, and, and I don't know, I could be wrong.
you know, maybe an approach that is all love and, and no memorization is the best, right? And maybe your approach that is all memorization and no love, although that doesn't sound particularly promising. But, you know, I, I think it's a fine line. And I think, you know, to your point on culture, I don't think culture is a bad thing. I think there's a lot of wisdom in culture. It anchors us. And if we deny it, it's actually more dangerous. You know how some Americans say, I don't see color? It's sort of a weird thing to say, right? Like, you know, like, where do you live, right? Like, who are you, right? Like, these things matter. Not in the sense that they, they differentiate us, but they, 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 they affect how we experience the world, right? So I have an example. If you have an interfaith marriage, I, I'm always a little bit worried when I hear about interfaith marriages because I think people underestimate the challenges inherent in them. But even intercultural marriages, and by no means is a Muslim am I against Muslims from different ethnicities and marrying each other. I think it's beautiful. But you have to really go into it very mature because you may think that the things that are Islam are cultural practices, and if you are not capable of having mature, difficult conversations about what does it mean to accommodate your family and my family, and you know, my parents will express this, and you're like, you really need to like do a lot of work to make it work. If you can't do that, you're setting yourself up for a disaster. That doesn't mean that just because you marry in the same ethnic group, everything works out you know, hunky-dory, but at the same time, it's an awareness of these things. So to pretend like there isn't culture is not healthy either, right? You can make a decision like, okay, I don't want to do that, I want to do that, and, and things like that, but you have to at least acknowledge that this is where we come from, this is the norms we live in are shaped by, and then we determine our relationship to them as we grow older. Yeah. Hope that made sense. Awesome. Yes. Minutes before sure. uh, Isha Kerr. Do we have any final questions here? No? I think we'll wrap it up, inshallah. Awesome. Jazakallah. Thank you very much, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah. Thank you.